morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's a blessing for us to be alive, amen? Amen. And it's a privilege for me to be here to be able to speak to us on this bright and beautiful Sabbath morning. Amen. I, uh, I'm so happy to be here because right now in New York, it's really cold. <laughs> When I was leaving, I really took me to the airport and he said, I wish I was coming with you. I said, next time, brother, next time. <laughs> and uh, so it's a blessing to be here. I want to solicit, solicit your prayers for um, a young man who used to work with us and he left this week on. Um, this was his last week and he came to our Bible studies. We have a Bible study that we conduct every Thursday morning at uh, the business. And uh, with some of the employees, some of the other contractors, and uh, he came and he said um, he learned quite a lot. But he moved to the, I think South Carolina. Uh, his name is Matt. So I want to ask you to keep him in your prayers. Before he left, I called him and we had prayer together. And I asked God that he will keep him faithful until the day when Jesus comes again. Amen. We may never see each other again in this life, who knows? But we hope that one day we'll meet again, amen? amen. And I, I also solicit your prayers for Bible studies uh, every Thursday morning from 7 to 8 at the business. And, um, it is such a blessing. Amen. We have a message to give. And we're going to give it with a certain sound. Amen. In a non threatening manner. So that others will have the privilege to make a decision for Christ. I also want to ask you to pray for me. I'll be speaking in um, Camden, uh, not next time, but the following Sabbath. I have an appointment here on the 8th, so pray for me that God will be glorified and, and we will be blessed, amen. amen. Uh, I invite you now to bow your heads with me as we have a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, it is with grateful hearts we come before your throne of grace. We give you thanks for being so good to us. We ask your blessing upon us. We cannot invite you here because you were here before we came. We thank you for inviting us in your presence. We ask, O oh Lord, that whatever is said and done will be done to bring glory and honor to your name. Open our minds and give us understanding. Speak to me, through me, and for me. Let your words be riveted into every fiber of our lives and may it have sanctified effect on our characters. May we learn something that will draw us closer to you and we will be careful to give you alone all the praise, the honor, and the glory. We ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to remind us that David said in Psalm 100, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all he lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Amen. It is a psalm of praise, so we got to give God the praise. Amen. Amen. It's a blessing to be able to come to a knowledge, a saving knowledge of the God of the Bible. Amen. Uh, my message is entitled, Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And I trust that uh, you will receive a blessing. David says in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet 
and a light unto my path. He said in verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse 9 says, Where it all shall a young man cleanse his way, but by taking heed according to thy word. So if your Bible came with you this morning, I want you to say Amen. If it did not come with you, I want you to say, oh me. <coughs> if there are any oh me's, the amens need to help out the oh me's. Amen. Thy word is a lamp. All the text that I'll be reading will be taken from the King James Version. And I, I want you to stay with me. Who is this Jesus? In the book of Revelation, John tells us, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he said that signified by his angel unto his servant John, who be a record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. The verse 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, you'll notice that a blessing is pronounced of all the 66 books in the Bible. A blessing is pronounced in the book of Revelation. John says in Revelation 1 3, Blessed is he that readeth, they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for a time is at hand. I turn your attention to the book of Acts, chapter 9 and verse 7. Acts chapter 9 and verse 7. Here the writer was telling of the experience of Saul, who became the great apostle Paul, uh, that would take the gospel to the Gentiles, who wrote 14 books of the New Testament. So he was giving his conversion experience. In Acts 9, 7 it says, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Now turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 22 and verse 9. Acts 22 and verse 9. Here Paul was giving his own personal experience on the Damascus road, um, his encounter with Christ. And Paul says, And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So in Acts 9 7 it says, the writer says, The men who journeyed with Paul, they heard the voice. Okay, in Acts 22 and verse 9 it says, Paul said they did not hear the voice. Now when critics read this passage, they would say that the Bible is contradicting itself. But I want you to know that there is no contradiction here. You see the word for here in Acts 9, 7 and Acts 22, 9 is aqua for ne. Aqua means to hear. From the word for you get the idea of sound. Megaphone, telephone, microphone. Aqua for ne means to hear without understanding in the genitive case. So if you heard something and you did not understand what was being said, it's the same as saying you did not hear. But the word for here in Revelation 1 and verse 3 is a different word. When John says, Blessed is he that readeth, the one who is giving the message, the one who is speaking, a blessing is pronounced upon the reader. A blessing is pronounced upon those who hear with understanding. The word for here in Revelation 1 3 is aqua for net. In the accusative case, it means to hear with understanding. So a blessing is pronounced upon the reader. Those who hear with understanding, and the blessing is pronounced upon those who keep what they hear or do what is being said. So a blessing is pronounced upon me, an additional blessing because I'm the one giving the message. A blessing is pronounced upon those of us who hear with understanding, and a blessing is pronounced upon those of us who do what we hear. So after you should have left this place today, and someone should ask you, well, what did the preacher, what did Brother B spoke about? And you could not give an answer. 
it means that you heard a loud noise <laughs> and you missed the blessing. So I want us to hear with understanding so you don't miss the blessing. Amen? Amen. And I want you to stay with me for the next uh, few minutes. All right? It's now 10 minutes to midday. Now I'm not a preacher yet. I believe you are not a Christian yet. And I don't have many so minutes. So we'll be here until I get done. Or until you get ready to go. Amen? Amen. You see, I'm from the islands. And uh, we preach long sermons. Now, I, I'm adjusting a little bit. So I'll make it short. Amen? All day belongs to God. This is the Sabbath. Amen? This is the day that He has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is our story today. There is nothing more embarrassing, more disappointing, more frustrating than looking forward for an event with great anticipation, with great expectation that you're looking forward to, that you plan for, that you're waiting, that you expect, that you dream about. And then you went to bed and you woke up a day late. All the fellowship has taken place. All the food has been eaten. All the gifts have been given. How will you feel? Looking forward to a great anticipation with great expectation for an event that you wish for, that you plan for, and you missed it, how would you feel? This is our story today. This is the biblical account of our story today about Herod. Herod the Great. He's not called the Great in the Bible. You see, the Bible does say very little. The Bible does not do him justice, but secular history gives us more about Herod. Secular history calls him Herod the Great. Why did secular history call him Herod the Great? Herod was the son of Antipater. Antipater was a descendant of Esau. Antipater was an Edomian. Edomians were descendants of Esau. Edomians believed in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Edomians kept the eating habits of the Bible. Edomians kept the Sabbath. Edomians looked forward for the coming of the Messiah. Edomians believed in the hope of the first coming of Jesus with great expectation. Herod grew up a believer in scripture. Most of us associate Herod with the act of killing babies. But that was a very minor act in the life of Herod. History tells us that Herod was a great builder. He was a statesman. You see, Rome had these clan kings to govern its kingdom. Herod was one of them. He had a clear line to Caesar. Herod became the greatest of these puppet kings, these clan kings. He became the greatest of them all. He was the most generous of them all. Herod, the baby killer, grew up with the hope of looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. No one knew that he would kill babies. The record tells us that Herod had over 100 children. He was the husband of many wives. At the time of Jesus, only three were kept alive. He had killed them all because they were, they were rivals to his throne. His favorite wife, Mariande, he strangled her with his bare hands with the fear that someone would take her from him. 
So killing a few babies in Bethlehem or Judah, which was a very small town, was a very minor act in the life of Herod. Herod the Great grew up a believer in scripture, but how do you reach that place? How do you get there? Something that you look forward to, that you wish for, that you plan for. Then the event came and you missed it. What happened? Before being too judgmental about Herod, many of us sitting here today, we are fearful like Herod. He began to fear the loss of power. He began to feel the loss of power and he began to fear the loss of power. And he did something that was very drastic. Nothing lasts in this life. I've read my Bible, the time is coming when we're going to lose house, we're going to lose car, we're going to lose family members. We're going to lose job. We're going to lose our security. How will it be when we have come to the point when it's only you and Christ? Will Jesus be enough? Everything will be taken from us. Will Jesus suffice? Will the hope of the coming of the, the second coming of Christ, will that be enough? Every Passover, every feast day, Herod would empty the, the coffers of his old closet and make sure that nobody went hungry. There are acts of righteousness, there are acts of kindness that Herod did that we cannot match. He was the most generous of all the client kings. On Sabbaths, Herod would do nothing of a secular nature in regards to his kingship. Herod, the baby killer, was a faithful servant keeper. Now, the, the old folks, back in those days, they looked forward for the first coming. Their hymns were centered around the first coming of the Messiah. Our hymns today are centered around the second coming. They missed it. Are we so sure that we're not going to miss it? Looking forward to, hoping for, planning forward to with great expectation. All of us are talking about the second coming of Jesus. He is coming again. His first coming was the deposit, was the guarantee, was the down payment that he will come again. But will we be ready when Jesus comes again? Will you and I be in that number when the saints go marching in? We live in a time in this world's history when it's not going to be pretty, amen? It's like an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing failure. Everything in this world is going to burn. Nothing lasts. All married couples will sooner or later once again become single. Nothing lasts. When we get to heaven, all of us will be in singles ministry. Nothing lasts in this life. The only thing that is going to be left is Jesus and you. Will that be enough? Every single one of us sitting here today, we are going to be tested and tried as though there is not another upon the face of this earth. Will that be enough? We've got to make sure that we are rooted and grounded on the rock, Christ Jesus. Herod began to fear the loss of power. Some of us sitting here today, we are more fearful of losing our job and our house and our security than our relationship with Jesus. It's amazing to me that the reason why people leave the church is because of people. People leave the 
says because of people. God is in the process of fixing all of us. Some people are more fixed than others. We are sinners saved by grace. It's a process called transformation. There are times when even when you were ordained to be an elder in the church, there are some days that you behave in ways that an elder should not behave. When you became a deacon, there are some days that you had some non-deacon days. Married couples, sometimes you act unmarried. Sometimes it plays off on Sabbath. You don't feel like smiling. You don't feel like shaking hands. You don't feel like greeting each other. What's the problem when sinners act like sinners? We are called by Jesus to be transformed, to be changed, but it takes time. Amen? Amen. Transformation takes time. Now, I am going to let nobody cause me to leave this church. Because this church ain't your church. Amen? Amen? The number one reason why people leave the church is because of people. Because somebody did not smile with them. Somebody did not shake their hands. Somebody did not greet them. Somebody did not hug them. Forget them. You're on your way to the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let nobody steal your joy. Let nobody steal your problem. Friend of man is going to get rough. A man's for a day of his own household. Amen. Christ says, I come to bring a sword. Amen. To cause division. Now, friend of mine, I want you to know that before you and I were born, God looking down to the corridors of time saw you and I on this place and this year, on this day, listening to this message. So you are not here by chance. You are here by divine appointment. Amen. And I want you to hear this message with understanding. Amen. And if you have a quarrel, don't quarrel with Brother B. You quarrel with Jesus. Amen. If you want a box, go with Jesus. And by the way, he has never lost a fight. Amen. Herod blew with the prophecies of the Bible. The prophecies in Genesis 3.15, the prophecies in Isaiah, the coming of the Messiah, the prophecies in Micah 5 and verse 2, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. He grew up with all this stuff, but when Christ came, he missed it. I turn your attention to the book of Matthew chapter 2. What book did I say? Matthew chapter 2. We're looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his time in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod heard, had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Can you imagine a new king? You know the story about the Magi, the wise men who came from the east? It's only recorded in Matthew and in Luke. Matthew chapter 2 and in Luke chapter 2. Micah gave this prophecy 700 years before Jesus was born. Micah said where he would be born, in Bethlehem or Judea. Micah said he would be a son. This is very detailed. Over 300 prophecies was connected to the life of Christ, and they were all fulfilled. The religious leaders in the days of Jesus had all the prophecies as to the coming of the Messiah. 
by the mission. Now I want you to notice something here. Why did Matthew not mention the shepherds in his uh, encounter in his introduction of the birth of Jesus? Why did he not mention the shepherds? And go with me to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Verse 1 says, There was a decree that went out by Augustus Caesar that the world should be taxed. Verse 2 says, Where the taxing was made first, verse 3 says, All went to be taxed. <coughs> verse 4, Joseph went to be taxed. Verse 5, With his wife Mary, who was exposed with child. Verse 6, She delivered. Verse 7, she brought forth her son. Verse 8, and there were shepherds in the field. Verse 9, the angels appeared. The angel of the Lord. Verse 10, said, I bring you tidings of great joy. Verse 11, for every you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Verse 12, where to find the babe? Verse 13, the heavenly host praising God. Verse 15, the shepherds said to one another, let us go and see this thing that has come to pass, verse 16, and they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in the manger. Luke is a historian. Luke is very detailed in his presentation. Why did not Luke mention the wise men? You see, whenever we do the nativity scene, we always put the wise man and the shepherd together at the same scene. I'm getting ready to tear it up. That's a lie. It's not true. Luke is a historian. He's very detailed. How could he miss this high ranking dudes? The wise men. They studied the heavenly bodies. They came from Persia, 800 miles away, by camel. The scientists tell of the coming together of the planets every 794 years. It happened seven times in the year 7 BC. The coming together of the planets. They interpreted Saturn meant world ruler, Jupiter meant Palestine, and that part of the heavens called the fishes they interpreted to be the last days. A new king, a new leader is being born in the last days. So they began to make preparation in 7 BC, heading toward Palestine, traveling by camel, 800 miles away. There is no way when the, the same night that the shepherds saw the star, which is really the angels, the same night the wise men saw the star that began the journey toward Palestine. There is no way that they could make it that very night. Now go back with me to the book of Matthew chapter 2. How could they miss it? Matthew chapter 2. The wise men came unless they have turbo powered cameras. <laughs> they came and inquired where the, the new king would be born. Or where is he? They were looking for him. Verse 10. What, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened the treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. <coughs> when they saw the young child, in the Jewish culture, a baby is not called a child until he or she is at least a year old. The wise men have been traveling for over a year from Persia, 800 miles away, 
to get to where Jesus was born. <clears throat> when they came to Herod, they said, we have been traveling over here. They saw the young child not in a manger, 